This conference will now be recorded. Again, I ask if you're not presenting or speaking, please mute your mic. Well, I've got seven o'clock and to be respectful of everyone's time, I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is the joint meeting of the Muscatine County Board of Supervisors, Muscatine School Board and Muscatine City Council, Wednesday, September 29th at 7 p.m. Cinda, will you please do the roll call for the city? Council Member Hopkins. Can you hear me, Mayor? Yes. Council Member Fralick? Council Member Malcolm? Council Member Gordon? Present. Council Member Brockert? Present. Council Member Gendrich? Present. Council Member Brackett. Present. I think I see Gendrich. John, are you on? He, he, he responded. answered he yes. Quiet. Okay. Yeah. I have four present, three absent, Your Honor. Thank you. Lisa, will Hello. you please do? Oz is there. I can see him. Okay. Okay. Lisa, will you please do the roll call for the school board? My pleasure. Director Cooney? Present. Debbie? Present. Draba? I know I saw her. Director Draba? Present. Director Finn? Present. Director McCarter? Present. Director Morgan? Director Schur? Uh, the Board of Education has five present and two absent. Thank you. And Nancy, will you please do the roll call for the county? Or, or is Ty be doing that? I can do it. Um, Thank you. Uh, Santo Saucedo? Here. Jeff Sorensen? Here. Uh, Scott Sauer? Nathan Mather? Here. And Doug Holliday. The, the county has three of the five board members present. Thank you. Well, we're going to get right into the heart of our meeting. Uh, we think this is a really good opportunity for the for the three governing boards to be able to meet and stay updated on current things that are going on in our community. And we appreciate our presenters for giving their time and coming to meet with us tonight. So we would like to start with a presentation on the strategic plan for Muscatine Power and Water. And please join me in welcoming General Manager Gage Houston. Welcome Gage and thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. And thank you all very much for letting me join you this evening. I do have a presentation. So let me see if I can get it shared up here. That's not what I want though. <laughs> How's that look? Works just fine. Looks good. Okay. Um, OK, 
Okay. <clears throat> it's not quite working in presenter mode, but we'll just keep going. So uh, wasn't sure entirely the scope of what to present to you this evening. I know the strategic plan was on the agenda. I will get to that. I thought I'd start with just a little bit of an overview of MPW and what we do in the community. So it may have been a while since we've had the opportunity to really talk to these groups. I know I haven't yet in my role, uh, just about what MPW does. And so I'll try to go through these slides really, really quickly uh, and then get into some strategic plan updates. And if we could make sure everybody else is muted, I was getting a little bit of an echo there. Uh, so we are a municipal utility, which means we are a government entity. Uh, we are non for not for profit, and we are represented uh, and controlled by a local board. So what that means to Muscatine is we do have local control. It's a local leadership that makes decisions uh, based on the best interests of Muscatine. Uh, we focus on low rates, not profits. So I like to say there's nothing wrong with profits, but we they're not a motivation for us. We focus on the rates of our customers. And it really is neighbors serving neighbors. We talk a lot about that internally here in our organization. Uh, when we make decisions and operate our systems, we know it's gonna impact our neighbors, our friends, our families. Uh, and I think that really matters when it comes to serving the community. Just real quickly, uh, we do have three different utilities that we operate, water, which was started in 1900, electric, which was started in 1922, and communications, which started serving customers around 1997. Uh, so we do actually have three different service territory boundaries for those three different utilities, and they don't match and align with the city limits themselves. And I don't know the whole history of that, uh, but at least in my time here, they've always been different. Uh, the electric boundaries are very rigid. They are controlled by the state. They don't change uh, very often, especially nowadays. Uh, the water and communication boundaries can be adjusted uh, at the discretion of our board. And you can kind of see, especially with the communications service territory, that has expanded as kind of the community has expanded uh, outside, or outside the bypass and along Highway 22 uh, to serve those customers. So I mentioned local control. This is our current board of trustees. Again, these are folks that you probably know, names and faces that you recognize. We are really lucky to have a long history of very good board members, and certainly with the, the slate of folks that we have now, very qualified, very educated, very committed uh, board of trustees that we have making decisions for us. Most of you also know our senior leadership team. Uh, again, the folks that live and work in the community, uh, and you've probably had some opportunity to interact with them in your roles. I won't go through these. We're really proud. You know, we've received national recognition for various parts of our operation, our utility. Uh, we take a lot of pride in being uh, really good at what we do and serving the Muscatine community. Uh, and it's neat to get that recognition occasionally. I'll provide a really brief overview of our utilities. Uh, but I, again, I'm going to try and go really quickly through this stuff. Our electric utility, we serve about 11,500 meters. So in terms of population, it's closer to that 25,000, but that's the number of meters we serve. We have almost 300 miles of electric lines in the community, and we are 24 seven operation, whether it be operators down at our power plant or in our dispatch office, we have folks that are serving the community uh, around the clock every day of the year. And we do have a robust electric generation capability. We do have a power plant just south on the south end of Muscatine, uh, and that has been part of our uh, operation for the last 100 years, and it's served the Muscatine community really, really well. I won't go through the details here, but all three of our utilities are really in uh, a time of significant capital investment. The electric utilities invested $20 million over the last 30 years in system upgrades throughout the community. We're projected to invest another 50 million in the next three years uh, with some very big projects uh, that we have coming up. I like to talk about rates because we've got a really good story to tell in Muscatine when it comes to rates. Our electric rates have uh, pretty much always been well below state and national averages. And you can see on the slide, I've got it broken out by customer classes. So in all three of our customer classes, you can see that we've got a pretty significant discount compared to our state and national averages for the cost of electricity. Not only does that help all of our residential customers uh, keep their bills low, but when you look at our business customers, it provides a competitive advantage in their industry by being able to operate their business at a lower cost. 
On the water utility, a few key numbers here. We have 156 miles of water main throughout the community. We pump almost 30 million gallons of water a day, and that is significant for a community of our size. I think we pump, we're like the second or third largest uh, water pumper in, uh, in Iowa. And for based on our population, that's pretty significant. And we have the capacity to produce about 40 million gallons a day. And that's important to have that reserve capacity to cover uh, unplanned outages or maintenance work on the system. And we do have above ground storage that can accommodate about eight and a half million gallons. But with the usage that we have, that can get used up very, very quickly if we have a disruption. And I love showing off that new picture of the lighted water tower, so cool. <clears throat> Uh, water utility also in the middle of a very heavy and capital uh, intensive uh, time frame for us. We've invested 13 million over the last four years in different projects on the system. Project to invest almost another 8 million in the next four years. You can see that first sub bullet there. Uh, a lot of projects that are really community oriented, uh, working with the city on the West Hill sewer separation projects, taking advantage of the opportunity where they have uh, the, the streets torn up and access to the underground infrastructure. We're taking advantage of that opportunity and replacing some of our water infrastructure at that same time. Uh, and then other projects on the system itself that we're working through. I won't go through this in detail, but it takes a lot really in all three utilities, but a few examples on the water system of what it takes to keep that system reliable uh, and keep the water clean and safe for our community. And the last bullet there, you probably all are directly familiar with, is our semi-annual flushing. Uh, we flush every single hydrant in the system twice a year. And it's a really important preventive measure to ensure that the system remains clean and free of um, deposits. Uh, so it provides safe, clean water to you. Again, a great story on rates on the water side as well. We don't have the same data at the state and national level, so we compare to our kind of two closest uh, metro areas in Davenport and Iowa City. And you can see again, in all three of our customer classes, we compare uh, very, very favorably on water rates. Part of that is just due to volume. Uh, on, a, on a per capita basis, we pump a significant amount of water and that does allow us to keep our rates lower. On the communications utility, uh, you're all probably very familiar with our fiber to the home project that we just wrapped up at the end of 2020. Uh, long project, $19 million investment uh, in the community, uh, but really should provide a lot of benefits to Muscatine in the long term, having that infrastructure in place, which is uh, very upgradable. It'll allow us to provide uh, increased capability and speed to the community. It's much easier to upgrade that fiber network because the fiber itself can handle almost limit, limitless speeds. Uh, and so that allows us to serve residential and business customers uh, very well in the coming years. Uh, and several other, a lot of these are behind the scenes upgrade on the communication system uh, that will continue to add functionality and reliability to that system over time. I wanna talk a little bit about just reliability of the communication system, because as we've gone through that fiber project, one of the benefits is that we actually should increase reliability. Uh, there's fewer electronics out in the field that we have to, uh, to work through during outages. And so we trend uh, the reliability on video, internet, and also our fixed wireless. We do have a wireless product that we uh, can offer to customers outside of our fiber territory uh, and with the investments we're making we continue to see those uptime rates uh, increase and you can see the chart starts at 98 percent so you're talking about 99.8 99.9 percent .9 uptime on these services i'll go through these slides really really quick but as most of you probably know mpw is very active in the community uh, educating school children supporting the community uh, through community events uh, nonprofit activities, we encourage our employees uh, to be involved in the community and put in their own time to volunteer uh, and try to make this community better. We do uh, work with Community Action of Eastern Iowa with Project Share that helps cover uh, utility bills for customers that are uh, in low income categories and struggle to pay their bills, especially during the winter time. Uh, we did a lot to, to help serve the community during the pandemic. Uh, we delayed rate adjustments, postponed late fees and disconnects. Uh, we did a lot with communications utility to provide services for school children in need, especially in low income households, work with the community foundation to provide an offering there. 
want to touch on these next couple of slides a little bit. Uh, so we like to calculate well, what, what additional value do we bring as being a municipal utility in Muscatine? One of the ways we do that is through lower rates. We talked about them being below state and national averages. Uh, we update this calculation every year and through lower rates, uh, in 2020, we estimated that we saved Muscatine about $3.6 million uh, by having lower utility costs. We also look at some of the other services we provide in Muscatine. Uh, we provide uh, free power and water to most of the city buildings, uh, parks and recreation areas uh, in town. We operate and maintain the street lights and the traffic signals in town at no cost to the community. Um, we offer a significant amount of customer rebates and free services for energy efficiency. Uh, and then we also, uh, it's kind of indirect, but we have lower property insurance rates in Muscatine because of the water system design that we have. Uh, uh, insurers rate communities based on their ability to provide fire protection uh, water. And we have a very good rating in Muscatine for that. And so we save uh, our customers money and property insurance. So that equates to another $2.1 million in value to the community. I won't go through this, but this is some of the things, some of those other services that we provide to the community uh, year in and year out. One of the other neat things is where we uh, facilitate, being the cable provider, we facilitate trying to get local content on the air. We have several channels that are now providing local content. We have four and the fifth one there is coming soon. Uh, but Civic 2 provides, you know, the city council, board of supervisors, school board meetings. Uh, we have public access. Uh, and we have our own MPW commercial access channel. Uh, the Muster Public Library now is a commercial access channel providing really some really neat content for the community. Uh, then Pearl City TV uh, will just be coming on as a new commercial access channel, uh, providing some more local content. So pretty neat stuff. All right, I'm talking fast, I know. We're gonna move into the strategic plan now. In 2020, we as a staff went through a very significant comprehensive effort to update and roll out an entirely redesigned strategic plan for Muscatine Power and Water. And what we landed on was really five core strategies uh, that we built that plan around. The first one is build great employees and leaders. Uh, I always looked at this as this, this is really important to look internally first. If we're gonna provide a first class operation and service to our customers, we need to have first class employees and leaders in our organization. And so I think that that really is at the core uh, and we have to start there to build out into everything that we do. Next, we wanna give customers reasons to love MPW. And we did pick that language intentionally. Uh, we've always provided, we feel good customer service to the community. We wanna really take that to the next level. We want customers to be delighted with their experience with us. Uh, the third is invest responsibly in reliability. This is a fundamental part of what utilities do is infrastructure. Uh, we need to make sure that we're investing wisely though. Uh, and as I mentioned, we are in a period of significant investment in all three utilities right now. The fourth is powering the future. I'll talk more about this in a little bit, but we're in a state, uh, a period of major transition in how we produce electricity for Muscatine uh, in the coming years. And so we've got uh, a lot of strategies around that. And the fourth is grow our services, or fifth is grow our services. Uh, so even though we, you know, we're here to serve the Muscatine community, we're, we're somewhat geographically constrained, we do feel like there are some opportunities to expand uh, some geographic, some just in terms of uh, offering more services within the utilities that we provide. So if any of you that have gone through strategic planning, you know that, well, that's the first step. Now it really goes down three, four or five more layers to get down to the actual action items and projects that you need to execute to deliver on those strategies. This shows just one level down. So we started with strategies and the next level is the objectives that feed those strategies. Uh, I won't go through all of these individually, but you can kind of get a sense here of uh, skimming through this, some of the core objectives within each of those strategies that we're planning to deliver on. And again, as I said, this goes down at least one more level uh, to get down in the detail of some of the projects that we're executing. I thought rather than going through all of that in detail, I could provide a few updates on just some examples of some projects and initiatives that we're working through now uh, that kind of feed in to that strategic plan. The first is falls under the strategy of giving customers reasons to love MPW, and it really feeds two objectives uh, for providing an interactive customer experience and exceptional outage response. When we built out our fiber of the home system, we have these new ONT devices now in every customer's home that has our communication service. Well, we found that that uh, device 
when it loses power, it sends a signal right before it loses power that says, hey, I'm losing power. We found a way to leverage that data and tie it into some of our other systems that we have, including our GIS mapping software, and then build a true outage management system around that. So now uh, we can map out when we get that out of power signal. Uh, so we can show that on a map. We also built logic to determine the scope of the outage and how many customers we think are out of power when we get those signals based on where they're coming from. And we've developed several internal mapping tools associated with that and also improved significantly our customer facing outage map. You can see a screenshot of it there. And we actually have two layers. We can show electrical outages and also fiber service outages. Uh, so if you are having an issue, you can go and you can view this on your phone. It shows up pretty decent on your phone as well. You can go to our map and see if there is an active outage in the area. And one of the benefits of that is if you know your areas, we already recognize there's an outage there, you don't even need to call. We're aware of it. We've probably dispatched a crew. We actually did have a situation where we dispatched a crew because we saw it on the map before we ever got an alarm. Uh, a breaker never operated and we never had a customer call and we already had a crew on the way before somebody called in. So that's the kind of proactive outage response we're trying to get to. Uh, the next example is uh, investing responsibly in reliability. And this is part of having a best in class electric system reliability. Many of you are familiar with, we're building a new transmission line to the north of town. Um, this is part a $17.1 million project on our side, but we're also partnering with SIPCO uh, we're building a transmission line from one of our substations in town to a substation just north of Muscatine on Highway 38. Uh, SIPCO then is upgrading a transmission line from there all the way to Davenport. So it's part of a kind of a coordinated effort to upgrade that, uh, that system. Uh, in total, about 30 to $35 million project. The benefit is we only get to pay about half of that and we get all the benefit on a reliability standpoint. So really neat to be able to partner with SIPCO. Um, we're working hard to maintain positive relationships with the landowners. These landowners actually aren't MPW customers, so kind of a unique dynamic. And uh, we had some hiccups early on. Some of you on the Board of Supervisors probably know. Uh, we had our vendor uh, that we had hired to assist with uh, the routing of the project really mishandled our first public information meeting with landowners. Uh, and so we had some rebuilding to do initially with those landowners. and through a lot of work of our internal staff, we've rebuilt those relationships and now have a very good working relationship with them uh, as we move on to construction of this project, which is ramping up now. You'll start to see a lot of activity uh, north of town here uh, and then hope to have that line in service uh, next year. And we haven't built a transmission line like that in this utility for almost 40 years. So this is a pretty historic project for us. Next is our strategy for is powering the future. So you probably heard us talk about this. Uh, we're providing updates in every board meeting. We've done a lot of public engagement. Uh, talked about earlier, we've got another activity coming up here in a couple weeks. Uh, but we're, we're on the cusp of a major transition in power supply in Muscatine. And so we've got some objectives to expand our renewable portfolio, uh, investigate replacement of local resources, which includes phasing out of our coal fire generation, uh, reduce our environmental impact, but also transition very reliably and safely. Uh, there's th These are major moves that we're talking about, and it's really, really important that we take a structured and planful approach so that we can maintain the integrity of the system as we go. So as part of this, I mentioned expanding renewables. We're currently investigating a 30 megawatt local solar garden at our Grandview Wellfield on the south end of town. We continue to attract customer interest in our different renewable energy offerings that we have uh, available to customers. We are investigating a new local resource, phasing out the coal fire generation that we have, looking at a highly efficient natural gas fired combined heat and power unit uh, to replace part of that. Um, and our goal is to reduce our carbon emissions from our local generation by at least 25% by 2024 and at least 65% by the end of the decade. Uh, and I really think we can outperform even those reductions uh, if things go to plan. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's really, really important to keep the existing assets in service as we make that transition. And our local power plant staff continue to remain very valuable uh, in the coming years to make that happen. <clears throat> When we look at this plan, we felt it was really important to find a solution that's right for Muscatine. 
uh, we are unique uh, in, in our operation in Muscatine. We have a very high commercial and industrial load for a community of our size. And so with those types of customers, reliability is important. Reliability is important to residential customers as well. A short outage could be a nuisance. A long outage can be deadly. Uh, and for our business customers, long outages can mean losses of millions of dollars in revenue. Uh, also for industrial loads, local resources provide a much stronger voltage support. Uh, industrial loads uh, draw down voltage on a system much, uh, much worse than residential loads do. And so it's better to have local resources to maintain that voltage. We also have an existing a large industrial customer that has a process steam demand. We've had a partnership with them for the last 20 plus years operating a combined heat and power unit and that's provided a benefit to all of our customers through lower rates by collecting margins on steam sales uh, and so we're looking at a way to continue to leverage that going forward and we think our plan provides some significant environmental gains but also while balancing affordability of rates and reliability of the system and this is we've talked a lot about this over the last several months is this kind of balanced approach uh, where we're looking at four factors reliability affordability, flexibility, and sustainability. Uh, and as I said, reliability has just become something that we anticipate and expect, and it's important that we maintain that. We also need to be very cognizant of rates. Uh, in addition to our residential customers, we have a high percentage of low-income households in Muscatine, so rate adjustments and rate increases have a significant impact. Uh, also for our business customers, uh, as I mentioned, low rates are a competitive advantage, and so we need to be very cognizant of that as well. Uh, the electric industry is undergoing some transformative changes and will do so in the coming decade. Uh, so we need to make sure that our approach is flexible enough to adapt to those changes in the coming years. But also we need to focus on sustainability. We do need to consider the impact of our operation and uh, that it has on the environment and the climate. And we look at air quality, water use, climate impacts uh, as we plan out these changes. Uh, and learn more. You know, this is a very important topic to the community. We've got a landing page. Uh, for Powering the Future on our website. It has a lot of background information. We've got a lot of FAQs out there to answer questions that we've heard from the community. And then we also have a, an open house event coming here on October 14th, where we'll have staff available, can come in, talk to staff, ask questions, get a little more detailed, intimate uh, dialogue going with our staff uh, for any questions that you might have. Uh, and then we're also doing a tour, tour earlier in the day with some of the elected officials and other community leaders uh, and we'll have the opportunity to do a bus tour of the Wellfield site as part of that. So it'd be really neat. Uh, just a few more here uh, on our fifth strategy for growing services. We have objective to electrify Muscatine 2.0. I say 2.0 because we already electrified Muscatine, but it was about 100 years ago. Uh, but we're really on a, on a new transition to where we're electrifying other energy uses, uh, not just in Muscatine, but throughout the, uh, the, the country. And electric vehicles is a big part of that. We developed a stakeholder group to get input on uh, how to expand EV usage. Now, there's a lot of charging stations now in Muscatine. We have one at our AO Center. H&I and All Steel have installed some. Alliant Energy has some on uh, University Drive. And we received grant funding through the state of Iowa for now three public chargers that we'll be installing hopefully uh, yet this year. <clears throat> We're also doing other things as a utility to try and incent EV adoption, including our early adopter rebates, $1,500 for new EVs registered in our area. We started with five, we bumped it up to 10. Uh, and I think we're down to one or maybe two of those left. So if you're interested, uh, jump on that right away. But other incentives and rebates as well on charger infrastructure to help uh, facilitate EVs. Another thing uh, we're really excited about is expanding our communications territory. We have a small expansion we're working on right now in the Rolling Meadows area up on Solomon Road just a handful of customers there but folks that have been asking for services for a long time with the new fiber system it's actually a lot easier to do expansions than it was with the old coax system those customers were hoping to tune turn up uh, in the next couple of weeks but we also just announced to our board uh, last night that we secured a five hundred forty seven thousand dollar grant through the state of iowa's broadband initiative uh, to do an expansion out highway 22 to the east uh, kind of upriver and you can see on the map there some of the kind of key neighborhoods and developments that we're, that we're focusing on that we'll provide service to would not have been possible without the grant the cost would have been too prohibitive uh, but with the grant uh, we feel this can provide a good return 
And so the benefit to all of our current customers is that with the grant money, we can do this at a reasonable cost that increases our customer base and that allows uh, more customers to share the fixed cost that it takes to operate the communications utility. Uh, and so that really is a benefit to all of our customers in the long run. Uh, in a similar way, uh, we're looking at expanding water services. And we've done, we've worked with some smaller developments uh, outside of the bypass on, on some things. But one of the bigger things we've talked about is working with Lawiza County stakeholders who are interested in providing uh, clean, reliable, low cost drinking water from Muscatine to some of their communities. Uh, very preliminary discussions, but I think it's important for everybody to understand MPW's approach to this we need to make sure that there's no financial risk to our current customers. So in any structure that gets put together, the Louisa County stakeholders would have to pay for the new water main infrastructure and be responsible for the ongoing operation and maintenance cost of that. They understand that, they're on board with that. They think they have potentially some paths to make that happen. It's also important that we understand any impacts to the water supply. Uh, we have a very stable aquifer that recharges very reliably. Uh, and we're actually losing some water retail volume through those power plant retirements in the coming years. Uh, the demand that we're talking about for these areas is very small, less than 2% of our current demand. And with the loss of the power plant water usage, we'll actually be pumping less water even if this expansion happens than we do today. So we feel very, very comfortable uh, that there would be no negative impacts to our, our water supply. Uh, the benefit to our customers is with no financial risk, uh, selling the water to these communities would just provide a gross margin on those water sales. And again, that would just go back to keeping all of our rates lower uh, for our current customers down the road. So I apologize if I went uh, too fast or maybe covered too much, but i um, happy to pause there and take any questions that anybody might have. Thank you so much, Gage. I know all of the bodies that join me in uh showing our appreciation for your time tonight and giving us this explanation and update on Muscatine Power and Water. In lieu of the time constraints and being respectful of everyone, if you don't mind, I, if you could put your email in the chat, Gage, for those that yep. don't have it, and I would ask people to reach out to you individually with their questions. Absolutely, anytime. All right, I'm sure- you probably a few know. You can probably tell I love to talk about this stuff. So I'm <laughs> for your, anytime you have a question. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We really Thank appreciate you. you coming tonight. Well, we're going to continue on. Next, we have an overview of the property valuation process and some of the current trends. Uh, so we've asked Muscatine County Assessor Randy Spees to join us tonight. And welcome, Randy. Thanks, Diane. I appreciate it. You have a PowerPoint as well? Yes. Okay. Go right ahead. All right. If we can get things to operate here, we'll... They work well when you practice them at the office. Now I came home, we're trying to get it to pop up here. So let's see what happens. There we go. All right. So can you see the screen, everybody? Yes, we can. All right. Well, we'll get started and um, so what is, what is Iowa property tax? Well, Iowa property tax is the primary uh, way to finance a lot of local governments. Uh, it's based on real property, uh, which mostly consists of land, buildings, structures, and other improvements. Uh, in Iowa, we have the following six classes, you know, residential, agricultural, multi-residential, which will soon be tied to the residential as of January 1st, 2022, uh, commercial, industrial, and then utilities and railroads, which are assessed by the state so um where does that where does that funding go where do who 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 requires that funding primary recipients of the property taxes levied include all of our schools and the community colleges our cities our county uh 
now and not so much the hospital because you know they've joined forces with some private entities but you know our emergency school districts my office the assessor's office townships uh that would be township fire cemeteries road it's it's just there's an array of people who are involved in that tax structure so in the agricultural extension district um So how are these taxes and property values figured? Well, our office, the assessor's office, um, and, the, and the Iowa Department of Revenue estimate values for each property. And this is called the assessed value. I'm, I guess I don't want to read all this. You, you guys can see some of that stuff. But uh, we use a manual from the Department of Revenue to, to establish market value. Almost all of our classifications of property are, are based on market value. Um, we uh, we um, have two classes um, property the agricultural properties and um, some of the industrial properties that aren't based on market but um, based on a revenue screen so but anyway that stuff's all assessed values are collected and shared with the auditor's office and the abstracts are filed the department of revenue um, on each class and not on individual properties um, and each year we we have to file the abstract with both the auditor and the state and those numbers are what we use to uh, bring a total values to the to the county to the city um, and what happens then is the process called equal is or equalization every every two years or on odd years and then every year there's an assessment limitation formula which is is based on a three percent allowable growth and that formula is based on a statewide number so you know your your bigger metropolitan areas like des moines and cedar rapids iowa city uh davenport benton or if you know those areas are growing very rapidly and uh, uh some of the smaller areas but you know so even though you're not having the growth in those smaller areas and the bigger areas are growing fast, they're tied to a 3% limit statewide. Doesn't mean that your taxes won't go up more than 3% because of market, but that, that's, that's, as you can read here, it's, it's based on um, revaluation, not new construction. So, um, but anyway, all that stuff goes into effect. Uh, they figure out a rollback the, the, that is in response to infl is that in, it's in response to inflation. Um, budgets are established by all the local entities. That stuff's reported to the auditor's office. They make a combined uh, millage rate, and then that millage rate is divided into the assessed value to come up with the, the, the tax rate per, per um, taxing authority or taxing district. And in Muscatine County, we have 60 taxing districts. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. Um, so, you know, there's gonna be a lot more questions that we're gonna, we're gonna answer here tonight. But I, I, I told Santos the other day that one thing I wanted to bring out in this in this meeting and in this presentation is that I have an open door policy. It doesn't matter if it's an industrial business, commercial business, or you know, for the first first homeowner buying their first home. I mean, a new homeowner buying their first home. If you've got a tax question, got concerns, you know, and want want to know about taxes, stop up at the office, give me a call. We can work through any scenario and and you know what what happens if I do this and what happens if I do that? And I can give you an answer on what, you know, what, what's the consequences are for your property taxes. But anyway, um, as we get these equalization or rollbacks put into place, there's always a couple more steps here occurring to test the adjustment assessment to the legal levels. Uh, the Department of Revenue, you know, like I said, they get all of that, all of those numbers. They also get all of our decoration of values. So they watch to make sure that we're in compliance uh, with our sales, with our assessments compared to our sales. 
we're supposed to be within 5% high or low. Uh, if we're not, they give us what they call equalization orders. Uh, and those just came out. I just received the equalization orders this morning in the mail, or yesterday morning, excuse me, in the mail. Um, and they were, as, as I expected, we didn't have anything on residential, no equalization on commercial, no equalization on industrial. We did have an order on agricultural properties. Um, then that's, of course, is the property that's based on a five-year rolling average of income. So, and it was a negative order, so we had to decrease the value of our agricultural properties across the county, in which we applied strictly to land. So, um, so with that, I'm pretty proud of that that we're staying up with the market because it's growing so fast. Um, and here's a little thing talking about rollbacks. Rollbacks were established, and, and this slide says 20 years ago, and I got to thinking about that on my way home, and actually it was probably closer to 40 years already, back in the 80s when, when we had another high inflationary period. They brought the rollback factor into play to slow down property taxes. So um, as you can see here, here's just uh, an example of some of the rollbacks. Uh, this one is actually the, the rollback for the multi-residential. Uh, but it shows that it started out at 86%. And it's lowered down now to 63.75 for the assessment for 2021, which will be taxes payable in 2022. And then again, at the bottom there, you'll read that it, it equals the residential rollback for 2022, which shows taxes will be payable in 2023. Um, so these, these residential and agricultural properties can fluctuate, but they can't, they have to fluctuate within that 3% limit. Uh, legislators changed that a few years ago. It used to be 4% and they've, they've tried to slow it down even more. So they limit it to three and that's not, like I say, not on an individual home, but on a class of property. Um, Make sure I didn't skip on my backup once. Okay. So what causes property taxes to change? Um, combined budgets of the taxing authorities. You know, the major cost for the most of our taxing authorities is probably people cost. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things that leads to higher taxes. The total value of property being taxed and then the taxable value. We've seen a, a major increase in values. Um, real, residential real estate is, is as hot a market as I've seen in the last 25 years. Um, it's just, it's un, unbelievable the, the, the growth of the residential market. And even the commercial market has taken off uh, to some extent. Just, but just for an example, right now, in the last year, our average sale price across the county on a 400 sales is 175,000 median sale price. And on that $175,000 sale price, I was undersessed by $147,500. Or my, my assessed value is 147500 so underassessed by 27. So we had to do some changes on some map factors. We brought in a new manual and updated the manual level, you know, to be within that 5% or be within compliance with the state of Iowa. So it means we're gonna have more taxable or more assessed value, which in the end run will be more taxable value. So there'll be more dollars to, to tax against. So when it comes to setting our budgets and we, you know, have to sit down and look at that and then make sure that we're getting covered because of the the backfill property tax, you know, the back, backfill property tax credits that come back for homestead, military credits, and um, the business property tax credit. And some of you might know that that they're going to try to they're going to phase out the business property tax credit, and that's never good. When they start phasing those out, I got a note today from the auditor that our claim for the business property tax credit 
was decreased or prorated. So we lost almost uh, half a million dollars on backfill from the state. So that's something that's going to affect some of our taxing levies right away here. I don't know why they came out that so late, but we'll have to ask some questions. And I think Tybee's probably going to address that with um, the Department of Revenue the next day or so. But and probably bring it up to the County Board of Supervisors here at the next meeting. But um, anyway, those things, those things all go into figuring the budget. Um, you know, so if you've got a higher value, but it's costing you more to run your, your, your city, your county, or your school district, you know, you divide those dollars into the, into the, the taxable value to come up with your mill rate. And that's how we come up with the taxable value for each property or the taxes for each property. So why might your, why might you pay higher taxes than your neighbor? It comes down to the size of your property, um, the overall quality versus your neighbors. You know, if, if every, if, every, if everybody had the same house and the same size lot, it would make the job pretty easy, but you know, there's not one house out there that they're the same. I have, I, I have people come in and they, Oh, my house is the same as the neighbors. You check it and his house is five, 600 square feet bigger, you know? So it's, it's it's a it's a lot of work, but um, it's I enjoy the I enjoy that challenge of educating people. So it's it's kind of fun showing people and bringing things you know bring them into the office and explaining to them how the system works and and letting them learn the whole system. I've got one more slide. This one is just an example of a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house and the and the change in the rollback factor. You'll see uh, the 2019 taxes, the rollback was just a little over 55%. Uh, and then in fit, and then the 2020 are the taxes that are payable right now for 21 and 22. The rollback went to 50, a little over 56%. Um, everything being equal, you know, it increased taxes on this property by $106 a year. Um, you know, not a lot, but, you know, it's the kind of things that get people excited and get them calling you guys as, as uh, uh, representatives of each each uh, authority. So I know I've had a lot of people knocking on my door and, and coming to the counter asking about taxes and asking about values. And you sit down and explain to them, uh, you know, how we're doing it and why we, why we do what we do. And then, then they get an understanding. But I know, I know that you guys are getting a lot of a lot of questions. So if you got some questions for me, we'll go ahead and can um, share those right now if you would like. Randy, if you don't mind putting your uh, email in the chat, I think it it might be better for people to reach out to you individually, and then we will all I think be interested in what comes in the next few days. Um, and learning about uh, the very late change in the backfill for this coming year. That's going to impact all three bodies, I know. Yeah, it's, it's, I know that they've got a program to phase it out. Some cities will go out in four years. Some will probably go out in eight, but it's, it's a bad deal. And we had that same thing happen back in the 80s or the 90s with the BIS machinery and equipment phase out. And it, yeah. it's not easy on anybody's budget. Well, I appreciate you bringing this information to us. And yes, if you'll share your email in the chat and folks can reach out to you and we'll look for more information from you and Tybee in the coming days. And, and I really appreciate, Randy, that I know you're always available to uh, anybody in the community or uh, elected officials if they have questions to to just call you and sit down and, and get an explanation of, of their new uh, tax assessment or, or just a question of general overall. So I really appreciate you taking the time to do that with everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, next on our agenda, we're going to hear a housing plan update from Community Development Director Jody Royal Goodwin. Welcome, Jody. Hi, thanks, Mayor. 
Um, I do not have a presentation, so I'm just going to talk through some of the things that have happened in the recent past since we first since we last talked about this at the March joint meeting. Right. So um, thanks for letting me take a few minutes of your time to talk about the Ignite Vitality through workforce housing, um, also known as the plan. Things have really been ramping up since the housing summit was held in March and we first talked about this. So that includes um, the adoption of the plan by both the city and the county. And at the same time, those were adopt it was adopted in April by those the jurisdictions. Um, Muscatine Center for Social Action also spearheaded the creation of a nonprofit housing cooperative that included Habitat for Humanity and Rebuilding Together to partner on housing initiatives and housing projects within the within um, targeted areas. This um, after the adoption, this was followed by an exciting request from Debbie Durham, the director of the Iowa Economic Development Authority, where she asked for a pilot neighborhood revitalization initiative from the city and the and the steering committee that was working on the plan. Um, and we presented this to Debbie and her staff in May. This resulted in identifying the mobile the area around Mulberry and 6th as the target area. At the same time, MCSA also partnered with Presbyterian, the First Presbyterian Church and Roy J. Carver Charitable Trust to purchase and revitalize two homes within that distressed neighborhood. And Calvary Church also selected and began revitalizing and um, renovating a home within walking distance to, to that neighborhood. Um, the steering committee also began working on refining the proposal for IADA, which city council supported um, and the submission of that proposal to IEDA at their July meeting. And simultaneously, city council and staff have continued to work on the Grandview Corridor initiative, which includes um, quality, focusing on the improvement of quality of life in that corridor through five pillars, one of which is residential and housing needs. And so, and we've also implemented the community heart and soul model of community engagement, which will focus on not on a range of activities that the residents feel could improve the, the community as a whole and housing has come up through that process. Um, throughout this time, the city of, Council, city of Wilton has also continued to work on their housing needs and they've been working with Rule 360 on the development of four houses, two of which are currently in the process of closing and two others are under construction, affected by, as all we all are, the, the supply chain issues. West Liberty has approved a 43 unit subdivision and is offering one unit or one property that they own as for infill development as well. And then it, within the city of Muscatine, Arbor Commons, the first new homes on that prop project began this spring. And so did the construction of three apartment complexes totaling about 150 units. At the same time, council has um, begun discussions related to property maintenance and um, how to improve the quality of housing through code and programs that support um, maintenance and revitalization of, of owner-occupied homes. And then we also have implemented a, a program that was focused on um, addressing the substandard and unsafe properties within the community by targeting those most uh, most severely distressed properties through with demolition. And to date, we have demolished one and have four more scheduled for demolish, demolition, sorry. And um, that allowed us actually to have the Homes for Iowa proper unit placed by the Community Foundation just this week, um, which will be offered to a moderate income family for first time home buyers before the holidays this year. Um, in addition, the City Council also recently adopted a number of strategies that will be used to support a healthy housing market in our community. And Wilton also initiated the um, development of a 35 unit senior complex. There have also been a number of other conversations within Wil with Wilton and City of Wil Wilton and West Liberty, sorry, too many W's, um, with their leadership about how to leverage activities and maximize the reasonable regional housing conditions to, to improve overall quality of life within Muscatine County. And so recently we began investigating opportunities to support the development of capacity within the construction industry, construction trades as it relates to the ability to meet housing needs, as well as alternative construction technologies that would maximize partnerships with educational institutions by looking at how we actually truly build the, 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 the structures 
sorry, the cat is wanting to play right now. And so the um, this also, we're looking at how do we utilize the fact that we have a plan and we have identified needs to, uh, to take advantage of some of the new funding opportunities that the Iowa Finance Authority just announced a couple weeks ago. And, but I really think the most exciting thing that has happened since um, April, March and April, when we first started really talking publicly about the housing plan is how other people have started talking about the housing plan, what those conversations look like, how, every, how, the, how the relationship between housing and economic development has really started to evolve and resulting in a number of conversations um, about how, how new, new players in the field get involved or new partnerships are established, including partnerships with, with industry and partnerships with developers that have really focused on commercial in the past who are like, oh, this really is what our community needs. And I think I can step into that, that, build, that field and, and, and help out. So I think that um, the commencement of the meetings of the Housing Council later this month, um, the first one is scheduled for October 25th, and uh, the members of that, the, the anticipated members of that um, council will actually be contacted in the near future, uh, probably within the week. And so we'll be commencing those meetings. And I think that will really further the conversation about how do we start to move it and making those connections between lending institutions and developers and landlords to, to truly create a holistic approach to how we address housing needs within our communities. So um, that's really what I've got. There's been a lot going on. I think that the idea that within the, within the county, there are almost 200 units of housing under construction at this moment in time, I think is truly impressive given the limited construction we actually had in the previous decade. So, but I'd answer any questions or I'll shoot you my email. I'm not too hard to find, but that's Thank all you. I've got. No. Thank you so much, Jody. The, we've had a lot of positive momentum in the housing area lately, and I know it's only the result of you and many others work on really putting the focus there. And it's really moving the needle and making a difference. So thank you so much. And yes, if you would please add your email to the chat list. And I hope people take, if, if people have any questions, I hope they take the opportunity to uh, reach out to any of these three presenters. Uh, and especially thank them for their time tonight and and get your questions answered. I know they'd all be happy to hear from you. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Have a wonderful night. You as well. Uh, we're going to move down to number five. Um, County Chair Santos Sacedo had some discussion questions he wanted to bring up regarding the transfer station access. Santos, do you want to? Yep. Yep. <clears throat> So again, thank you guys all for being able to help join us. Um, I had just a few comments. I had a, a meeting with um, Dave Pop um, recently in the last couple of weeks in regards to comments and calls that we were getting from county residents in regards to um, oil <clears throat> and disposal of oil when they were going in to, to take something to the transfer station, couches, whatever. And it was shared with them that obviously they're not a city, you know, um, resident so that now that the city's new plan moving forward was not allowing them to dispose of the oil. Um, <clears throat> some of them were just outside of Fertland and some of them were on the north side of, of Muscatine just outside the bypass. I, I contacted Dave basically the change is what you guys have. What the challenge was is that some of these residents were like pretty much just saying well it's just going to go in the trash then because this is more difficult than what it was. Obviously not a good discussion when they share with that knowing that that's going to probably end up in our landfill anyway and <clears throat> when Dave shared with me he explained to me the the issues that they had already been having with the city of PCBs and items that were I think going into the oil tank that they would normally have so they were under some limited use of it but in the essence of trying to protect our aquifer and in our landfill, I guess my concerns is just making sure that either we can find a way of communicating that because now that what David replied to me today was in regards to there's the Muscatine AutoZone does take some oil, some O'Reilly's does, and I think the new CarQuest opening up will as well. <clears throat> so I think those are positives, but 
the still the 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 concern was is if there was a way that they could drop that off. If not, then maybe we could at least communicate that maybe in a joint effort between MPW, um, the city and the county. Having that limited access that that brought on um, one of the more recent things that we just was made aware of this morning in regards to uh, clippings as well at the transfer station. Um, we had a uh, city or county resident county employees that were asked to to drop off clippings from the courthouse. And I was just made aware of this today or else I would have contacted Dave on this, but <clears throat> they're being charged $30 um, because we're not a city um, uh, purchaser of the trash, which is a concern for me from that perspective. And, and I really think that it's a concern, the fact that we're trying to build relationships between the city and the county. And obviously that's discouraging when, when we see that type of perspective the the part when i come from a county resident that wants to drop off trim trimmings or clippings or even oil um I, I really wanted to entertain or possibly request that the city council look at uh maybe even a limited uh privilege you know sticker or some sort of way of of allowing county residents to purchase things because as we just saw through the presentation of mpw a lot of the access to what MPW is serving, which is a board that reports to the city council, is outside of city limits and into the county. Um, if we're if we're expanding, obviously as the city grows, the the county will will have some of those expansions as well. But if we're wanting to utilize our services and leverage having more people be able to offset costs, then um, it probably means that we probably want to build relationships and have positive relationships versus. Um, having situations like this that I think could be better handled um, than what we have. So I, I really am just asking that the city council um, look at maybe some way of uh, maybe creating some sort of a limited privilege sticker or a purchase that allows county residents to to utilize that. I believe that county residents would be entertained with that um, and allowing them to be able to drop off trimmings or clippings um, as the example will or um, Fruitland is because the trash gets picked up there. So <clears throat> I think that's something that at least um, I would like to request and then have you guys maybe have a discussion with that is all I'm asking. Thank you, Santos, for bringing this up. You know, this is another one of those situations where we can't uh, work on anything if we don't know about it. So this is something that was has just been brought up to us and we appreciate that you're doing that. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the reason that we're having these meetings, the reason that we're talking is that we want to build uh, teamwork and build relationships so that we can work for the best of the public good. And, and when we work together, we always know that produces better outcomes. So um, I, I talked to Dave. I know you talked to Dave. And, and, uh, and I know that there are some reasons uh, for the the parameters that are set around the transfer station. And we know that some of the things are open to the county and some of them are not. And so um, I would like to ask for um, Dave to have an opportunity to maybe to, to put together some opportunities. I know that county residents are allowed to drop off uh, grass clippings and, and use that part of the transfer station for a fee. People who live in the city limits uh, get a sticker and so then they can use it at no cost because they really aren't using it at no cost. They pay for that service in their bill um, that's uh, ran through Muscatine Power and Water, but people that live outside of the city limits, they do not pay that fee on their Muscatine Power and Water bill and we know that we can't have city residents taxes paying for services to the county. So it's a fine line there. We're absolutely willing to take a look at it. And, and there's very various reasons for the oil part. Um, that's a separate thing. And, and we we're w more than willing to take a look at um, what kind of uh, options we have there for oil dropping off for the county. You know, with uh, the environmental concerns, that, that is a really big issue. And there's a lot of restrictions and governance over um, items like car oil. And so we have to be very careful and make sure that we're following all the DNR regulations. And that's why that's a little bit different than clippings. But 
Santos, if you would uh, give us the grace to take some opportunity to take a look at that and perhaps um, come up with a couple of options on adding the oil in. As I said, the clippings are already in there. They just pay uh, a small fee when they drop them off. That's uh, quite quite the same as when the city residents pay through their Muscatine Power and Water Bill. But the oil, you're absolutely correct. They have not had the ability to drop that off the transfer station. We'll take a look at that and then we'll share that when we get more information, if that's all right with you. Yeah, and and I think the, the question that my staff had when we, we had that discussion was, you know, we the, the county pays $40,000 38,500 to the Solid Waste Commission. And, you know, we don't really have, I, I try to message Sherry asking them what, what's, what do we get out of that if we're getting charged to take clippings ourselves to the transfer station? Um, and I don't know that, so I'm hoping to find that out, but, but those are the types of examples that I think are discouraging from staff when they request to that, you know, that they didn't know what they were doing wrong. Obviously we're having our employees from the county drop off clippings and get charged and they didn't have they didn't have funds on them so that it was it was a, it was a, obviously not an efficiency from our perspective but something that i wanted to share that it's not just the clippings for the county residents it's also something that i want to help um build that relationship from the county because it doesn't help us at all i will say that that is a it is a uh, frustrating perspective from from me and also something that I, I obviously want to make sure that I'm trying to meet those needs from the staff as well, too. I understand. And you're right. Some of those, like the fee that you're paying, um, we need to do some some deeper dive into that and find out what that's for. A lot of these things are are things have been going on for years and we don't know what the setup was for that. But if you'd give us an opportunity to look at that, there might be a specific reason for that fee. It might be um, part of being able to have, you know, the county residents can take trash to the transfer station. And so that might be what that fee is for, which is completely separate from the the grass clippings area. So so we'll have to do some digging on that. But as I said, we're willing to work on this and uh, see what we can do so that this uh, ends up with a positive outcome for everybody. Mayor, this is this is Jeff. I just, I just want to make a comment quickly because uh, this has been an issue that we've seen just in various forms over a number of years, and that's kind of city versus county thing. And I think that any of these public type service entities, when they make changes, we have to think about long term. You know, I, I happen to be a property owner close to the transfer station, and I remember a number of years back when they changed a policy on tires and all of a sudden my parking lot became a dumping place for tires. Now the city was great and helped out with that, but it's it's we have to think about the long term. I, I kind of remember when flow control was talked about when they were there was budget issues and then all of a sudden we saw a lot of illegal dumping in the county and all of those things. So I think we have to be we don't just operate within city or county borders. We're all neighbors and every little action can have a adverse reaction and the last thing i want to see happen is that spent motor oil or trash or anything gets put out into the into the environment and not controlled i think that's what we're all trying to stop that we have the professionals managing it we take it and if it's a money issue then we talk about money separately absolutely and i think you're absolutely right jeff um and we are in the, the process now of of doing a better job as working as a team. And you're right, the city, the county, the school board, we don't live and work in isolation from one another and everything that each one of us does impacts the other. And so having discussions and being having everything uh, up on the table for us to talk about and work through together as, as partners, that's gonna give us all the best outcomes. And And we're there and we're willing to do that. And I think that's a win for the entire community. Yeah, and I, I would like to pipe in just real quick on that, Mayor, if that's all right. Identify yourself, please. This, this is Kelsey Brackett. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just, uh, you know, I, I think that an easy thing to tackle on that maybe would be to find a way to streamline, at least in the interim, while we look at options, a way to streamline the ability for the county to drop off those uh, grass clippings uh, without having to be carrying cash. They're on site, so maybe we could find a way that we could, uh, at a minimum, 
streamline that piece, have some uh, an account set up for them at, at a minimum. So until we can figure out uh, a potential uh, partnership on that and something that works out better in the long term. We actually worked on that yesterday, and I think we um, are in a good position there to buy us a little time to to be able to do some investigation and come up with some possible solutions. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. I think we're good. Yeah. Great idea. Thank you. Uh, I, I, if, if you did, I didn't. I wasn't aware that you guys had already been working on this. Again, I, I was just made aware of this this morning. But when they had asked me, they said, "Well, what happens if we have to, you know, do our leaves, or we have things in front of the courthouse, or things like that?" So are we now separating those relationships? And and I I didn't have the answer to that. So I just wanted to share that it's not just the Trent Clemens. It's going to eventually be things like that um, from sure. simple uh, leave it things. Was, so it was my understanding that it's uh, infrequent that grass clippings from the county themselves ever come up, but that there was an account established here in the last few days uh, for for it to just be charged, and then we can deal with that later. So no money has to be done on hand. An account was was recently set up just to deal with that for now. And then we can take a look at it and, and investigate what our choices are. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again. I, I appreciate everybody's time and listening to um, my points. Absolutely. And once again, the only way that we can uh, make these things better is if we talk about them and know them and have an opportunity to address them. Thank you, Santos. The last thing on the agenda for the evening that we had was um, I, I hope that everyone uh, in each one of the bodies has uh, recognized that there's a need and that we all uh, benefit from having these joint meetings and learning together and being able to network and partner on things that are relevant to each one of us. And so moving forward, I, I'm hoping that everybody is uh, in agreement that, that we want to continue with this and we're trying to work out the bugs on the scheduling and, and the um, planning the agenda and those kinds of things. So I just wanted to propose that um, we plan three meetings each year, uh, one in the beginning, one in the middle, one closer to the end. And, and if each one of the bodies would uh, agree to take responsibility for one meeting. So we would each have one a year and we would um, we would run the meeting like I've done tonight. We would send out, you know, put together the agenda, find out what, what everybody wants to learn about or hear about, and then make those arrangements for the presenters, put together the agenda, get it set out, set up the meeting time, and uh, then run the meeting and do the minutes. So uh, I think that would be, definitely doable for us as a city if we had uh, just one meeting to be responsible for and certainly um, assist in any way on the other ones that if needed. But if each one of us would take one meeting, I think that would make it work for everybody. At least I hope so. Any thoughts on that? It sounds reasonable to me, Mayor. This is Councilman Brackett again. <laughs> Yeah, and I, um, I think that that's a, a simple fix. I think knowing um, as we start looking at some of the upcoming um, American Relief Dollars Act and, and some of the projects that we're going to be working through, I think it would be a, a good upcoming year as we start looking at some of those things to what different groups are doing and maybe again keeping that communications open. So one per year for us as well, too. Okay. Does that work for you, school board, Tammy? Or Mayor, this is Tammy Drawba. I think it's a, I think it's a great recommendation, uh, and I like, uh, I think it's a great idea to divvy that work between us. I would say let's just uh, put those dates in place, so one, everybody can get them on their calendars, and we make sure that we don't have, um, it, you know, any any sort of uh, other obligations that would conflict with those dates. But I, I think the continued communication is helpful. Well, if you would like, we can, uh, we can at least come up with the months and who's going to be responsible for them tonight. So I'll, I'll speak first for the city. We could do the second one of the year. We'll do the last one. This is for the county. 
Do we have months attached to the first, second, and third meeting? I'm willing to take whatever anybody wants to throw out. So whatever work. So what? What would be a good month for you, school board? Tammy. Um, Clint, I'm going to ask you to weigh in on that one. I think if we're looking. Uh, go ahead. So would this be considered the first meeting or the next meeting considered the first meeting? So we're talking about 2022. Yeah, I, I think September, October, either one is is probably a good time and a good as we're starting school. There's an opportunity certainly for us to update um, on the year ahead. So, County, would you be willing to switch then since they want to do September, or October for of 2022? You're asking the county, is that what you said? Yes, if you would go earlier in the year. It sounds yeah. like the school board wants to do September, October. This is yeah. Nathan with the county. I would, <clears throat> excuse me, just say we need to structure it so we don't put it right in the middle of our budgeting process, which is absolutely time of year for our, all three of us, I think. Yep. So what are the best months then? I guess that's a better way to look at it. Is the end of March still too close to the budgeting for everyone this is uh, nancy. this is nancy that would work fine for the county the end of march yeah. okay okay and the end of september for the school and then the end of june for us does that work carol um i think so okay and so like tonight was a wednesday night at seven so and it's the last do we want to go for the last wednesday in march at seven the last and organized by the county the last wednesday of june at seven organized by the city and the last wednesday of september organized by the school board does that work for everyone? That sounds good. And March, the last Wednesday in March of, of next year is the 30th of the month. So that should uh, put it as far from the end of budgeting as possible. Okay. If we're still in March. So. so if anybody has their calendars, I'm trying to grab my calendar here real fast. So we would be looking at... March 30th at 7, organized by the county. And June 29th at 7, organized by the city. And September 28th at 7, organized by the school. And of course, what, even if it's your turn, you know, please reach out to all, everybody can reach out to everyone else for ideas on, on presenters and topics and anything else for the good of the order. Otherwise I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved, this is Councilman Brackett. I'll second it, Ms. Santos. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. Take care, Bye -bye. everyone. You as well.